Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Lauren Swain. I'm coordinator for Physicians for Social Responsibility of Colorado. And while we wait for people to join, I'm going to give the land acknowledgement, which really helps frame the importance of equity in all of the conversations that we're about to have. Thank you. We honor and acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the temp traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. We also recognize the 48 contemporary tribal nations that are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. We honor and thank elders past, present, and future, and those who have stewarded this land throughout generations. We recognize their contributions and rights within the space we share today. We also recognize that government, academic, and cultural institutions were founded upon and continue to enact exclusions and erasures of indigenous people. We also acknowledge the land, the labor of enslaved Africans and their descendants who worked the stolen land for the colonists and who continue to disproportionately face economic oppression, racism, violence, and exploitation and we recognize their contributions and rights within the space we share today. May this acknowledgement demonstrate a commitment to working to dismantle ongoing legacies of oppression and inequities affecting all communities of color in Colorado. So I am Lauren Swain, with, coordinator with PSR Colorado and we are the Colorado chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibilities. And I also represent the Healthy Electric Homes program of PSR Colorado, which is focused on solutions to replace the use of fossil gas in our homes for health and for the climate. Um, PSR and PSR Colorado are organizations dedicated to raising the voice of health professionals in environmental health conversations. We're very concerned about the effects of inequality, um, the effects of pollution on our communities, the effects of climate change, and we have our roots in the movement to protect our country our communities and our world from nuclear weapons and nuclear power facilities and the hazards that they impose. Um, we're not so really far off from the mainstream when it comes to our concerns about climate change. Uh, even the American Medical Association, a fairly conservative group, has an official climate policy that declares climate change a public health crisis that threatens the health and well being of all individuals. They further state that the AMA will protect patients by advocating for policies that limit global warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, that reduce US greenhouse gas emissions aimed at a 50% reduction in emissions by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2050 and the AMA supports a rapid implementation and incentivization of clean energy solutions and significant investments in climate resilience through a climate justice lens. I'm very, very pleased to be here with all our guests from the city of Fort Collins, the city of Denver, the city of Crested Butte, Boulder County, and the city of Boulder. And we're so grateful to have them here with us today I'm just giving a quick overview and then I'll introduce our guests and they can give us their presentations representing years of work building up to the policies and programs that they've established in their local communities. So just to frame, why are we doing this? Why are we making such an effort? Why are we making investments? Why are we having uncomfortable conversations about the climate crisis? Because it affects Human health, it affects us all. It affects our well being daily. The causes of health impacts from the climate crisis and fossil fuels include injury and death from fires, flooding, droughts, and accidents, water pollution and scarcity. I bolded extreme heat here because that's one of the things we're addressing today with our discussion of how to, um, of promoting building electrification. 
a poor indoor air quality at, or outdoor air quality from smoke, vehicles, industry, and building emissions, and poor indoor air quality from burning gas in residences. These are the leading causes of health impacts from the climate crisis and fossil fuels. Uh, the health effects of the climate crisis and the air pollution associated with fossil fuel use is our acute, acute impacts, heat illnesses, asthma attacks, injuries. There are serious effects from extreme heat, from air pollution on children's health, maternal health, workers' health, mental health, and too often all these impacts on our health lead to premature death. The societal costs of the climate crisis and on air pollution include educational impacts, schools closed due to extreme heat, to disasters. Children are affected in their learning by extreme heat, by air pollution, by trips to the hospital, high health care costs for individuals and taxpayers, labor productivity and costs are affected and those affect us all. The loss of caregivers through premature death, the loss of income through premature death and illness, these are impacts that cannot be overestimated, the impact that all of these can have on our lives. So my background is in fighting fossil fuel production. Uh, when I learned about uh, fracking, it, it really floored me that the government allowed it, such a thing to occur, uh, giving the knowledge of uh, the damage that it does. Um, but here we are, we're still producing fossil fuels we're fighting to keep fracking out of Aurora. And today, uh, the state of Colorado, unfortunately, may approve more fracking in Aurora. It's a nightmare. Um, we know very well the risk and harms of fracking that are well documented in PSRs, a uh, national publication with concerned health professionals of New York, known as the Compendium of the Risk and Harms of Fracking. Colorado is cited many, many times in this compendium as a state where the health impacts of oil and gas production are unmitigated by regulation. Fracking with Forever Chemicals in Colorado, that's another publication at the national level indicating that Colorado has a serious problem with the chemicals emissions uh, and harms to our health from fracking. But we cannot do it just by reducing production because a lot of the GHG emissions are from the use of fossil fuels. Uh, a lot of the air pollution is from using fossil fuels and the demand for fossil fuels is what drives production in the first place. So we must address use and demand for fossil fuels for our climate and health. And building electrification, the use of heat pumps is one of the major climate solutions that solves the problem on so many levels, not completely, but it, it, it's, it, it is, has a strong impact on the demand side for production. It reduces emissions itself from our homes, from our buildings, and it helps mitigate extreme heat because these heat pumps also provide cooling, whereas our gas powered furnaces do not and require extra energy consumption to um, to cool our homes as well as heat our homes, whereas heat pumps do that with one appliance. So I'm sure everybody, all of our guests can go into much more detail about the advantages of building electrification as well as the programs that support it at their local levels. So let me begin by introducing Colin Tom of Boulder County for background that applies to all of us. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks very much, uh, Lauren, and I'm going to try to put my, uh, let's see, I need to, let's see, someone else is sharing, I'm putting up share, let's see if I can do this. Can you all see that? I can't see you anymore. Is that good? Uh, no. Yep, go to slideshow and you'll have it. All right, how's it, says from the beginning, how's it look? That looks beautiful. It's amazing. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, wonderful to see everybody today. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, sorry, this slide is from a previous presentation, but I will quickly um, pivot away. 
My name is Colin Tom. I am the climate and health strategist uh, for Boulder County, meaning that I do mostly state level uh, policy work here. I've been at Boulder County about 15 years, uh, part of it in public health, uh, about 11 years there. Uh, everything I do has a health focus and uh, an equity focus as well. So I'm just going to hit you with a few statistics that I found really compelling. Um, working with uh, RMI and others, we have um, put together a group of st uh, statistics um, that are really impactful as to the impact of burning fossil fuels in buildings. And so um, I wanted to just let you know that neither, uh, nearly three quarters of homes, that's like 75%, uh, burn fossil fuels in furnaces, water heaters, stoves, and fireplaces. This slide is really simple because it it, it is that simple. There, uh, those devices that we all use, um, or most of us, uh, do have significant air quality impacts, and it is really most of us. Um, and burning gas in buildings really does strongly impact our air quality a lot. Um, it's uh, the primary pollutant of concern uh, is is NOx or nitrogen oxides. You may be familiar with uh, this pollutant. It, uh, it The world's most simplified chemical equation here, uh, oversimplified, is uh, because the real mechanism is crazy complicated, and there are so many of them. But uh, NOx in the presence of sunlight in combination with volatile organic compounds produces ozone. NOx is also a particulate uh, um, uh, precursor. So it contributes to two of the major pollutants of concern in our area. And you may know, uh, especially these days, that our area is already in severe non-attainment of federal ozone standards. Uh, we have been uh, downgraded as severe. We're looking at another potential downgrade uh, coming up soon. And if you've uh, not been on vacation somewhere else in the last couple of weeks, uh, you've observed uh, not just a haze, but also uh, ozone alerts um, every day, pretty much for the for the last many days. Um, and uh, that is the reason that the American Lung Association once again gave us an F um, for air quality in this area. Uh, it's very disappointing. A lot of us are very uh, outdoor oriented, exercise oriented. We want to be healthy. We want to ride our bikes to work. And it's frustrating uh, to, to have this situation. And, you know, so the, the impact of burning gas, natural gas, fossil gas, methane gas, whatever you want to call it, in residential appliances, uh, I've, I'm just throwing the statistics out here simple because they are so impactful, um, is that the impact of residential gas appliances alone is more than three times or nearly three times as much as the state's gas-fired uh, power plants emit. And uh, when you're looking at residential and commercial appliances, we're looking at more than eight time, 18 times as much as the state's oil refinery, uh, Suncor, and more than the lawn and garden sector altogether. And this is both statewide and in the non-attainment area. So a serious concern uh, for ozone, for particulates, and then of course, bear in mind that ozone itself is a greenhouse gas. So lots of positive or, or negative, depending on how you like to think of it, feedback loops to be concerned about there. Um, when it comes to ozone, I don't think I really need to tell physicians about the impacts of ozone, um, but uh, you know, respiratory dis uh, distress, it, it uh, increases the rates of asthma, uh, it uh, is hard on your lungs, it's sometimes called, uh, exposure is called a sunburn for the lungs. Um, I certainly experience issues uh, related to ozone, have to shift everything to the morning. Um, and uh, we, we have been averaging 44 ozone action alerts per year. Um, I, this, is a, <laughs> this is my little sketch on top of the EPA's graphic that you may have seen. Uh, I added a gas rig, um, a gas well and uh, uh, set up here uh, in my bad shorthand. Um, and because, you know, the, as, as Lauren was alluding to, oil and gas is a major uh, influence here, but so are all the homes and businesses um, that we have uh, emitting all that um, pollution from burning uh, gas. I should also mention the indoor air component. So even though we are talking about uh, outdoor air quality right now, when we're talking ozone and um, some of the particulates and greenhouse gases, uh, 
stoves emit considerable indoor air uh, pollutants and also even vented furnaces and hot water heaters uh, experience backdrafting and are not perfect um, in their venting. And so there are considerable health impacts from burning combustion or burning um, fossil fuels indoors. And so what are we doing about it? We are doing a lot here at Boulder County. Um, we have uh, a commercial business sustainability advising program with incentives. Uh, we have resid that is uh, Partners for a Clean Environment. Uh, that program has been around for more than two decades. Uh, Energy Smart is residential advising and incentives. Both of these programs are driving towards electrification and assisting particularly um, low-income disadvantaged and uh, minority and woman-owned businesses in uh, achieving electrification through heat pumps and through uh, the um, lawn and garden equipment, electric lawn and garden equipment. Um, but principally when it comes to buildings, we're looking at heat pumps, induction stoves, and heat pump water heaters. Uh, there's also at Boulder County Public Health, the Healthy Homes program that focuses on indoor air quality. And then um, you probably or may have, uh, maybe that's just me feeling really good about it, uh, seeing uh, that uh, the Denver Council, Regional Council of Governments, um, together with uh, actually some uh, uh, the other folks on the call here, um, my dear colleagues, we uh, put together a grant and uh, we, we got a zero emission building initiative together for uh, the region. And I will let Mac talk more about that uh, as he presents, um, but that will bolster um, and kind of flow with existing programs to create more advising incentives and workforce development. And there is a strong equity prioritization for all of that um, in the grant. Um, Boulder County also does considerable policy work. Internally, we have the Build Smart program, which requires more of large buildings and more uh, efficiency and renewable if there is fossil fuel involved to the point that it drives towards electrification. Um, externally, we do do considerable state level building policy work. Um, I, with my colleagues here, have worked on the building performance standard at the state, as well as um, uh, on legislation towards the state energy codes um, that set are, are currently working to set strong minimums uh, uh, that will assist in moving towards electrification uh, for uh, new construction. Building performance standards are for existing buildings uh, over 50,000 square feet. So it's a start. It's, it's not everything, but it's a start. And the Northwest Regional Met uh, Building Policy Cohort and the Building Policy Collaborative from Dr. Cog's grant um, are really organizations of local governments that get together and try to drive their codes towards electrification. It's easier to do so in groups and uh, where you have the partnerships to work through implementation issues and uh, the inevitable uh, you know, growing pains and hiccups when you're implementing something as bold as we need to do. And so it's great to be in this company. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for having me. I've put up my email and also um, that of our chief building official if you have questions about our, our um, building programs. Um, I will be happy to share more uh, information like this and some of these statistics if you all are interested. And I wanna make sure I still have time for others. So I'll hand it back. Thank you very much, Colin. I just learned so very much from you and I really appreciate your presentation and the good work Boulder County is doing. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from the city of Boulder and Carolyn Elam. So um, thank you very much for being here as well, Carolyn. I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. And now I will go through and see if I too can um, successfully share. All right. And... Okay, so you see it in presentation mode. I I see it. Uh, I I can see. There we go. Now it's in presentation mode. That looks great. Thank you. Perfect. Excellent. So thank you everybody again. I'm um, Carolyn Elam. I am a senior manager here at the City of Boulder in our Climate Initiatives Department. Been with the city for the last six years and and spent um, my, my career here in the um, climate space. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Um, I'll, I'll keep it brief as well and make sure we have time for questions. Um, 
I just want to go to this. I think most people are aware of our goals. Um, Boulder has adopted um, a commitment to be carbon neutral um, by 2035 um, with interim goals to, to reduce emissions by 70%. Um, we've been setting a greenhouse gas emission reduction targets um, for some time dating back, um, I think, to 2006. We adopted our first goals consistent with the Kyoto Protocol and updated those. You know, as we've been on our greenhouse gas reduction journey, um, we've also become a lot more sophisticated in our understanding of, of the connection between our work to reduce emissions and our work um, to address health equity and resilience as well. And so we really um, shifted a lot of our focus and a lot of our conversation, especially for our local work, um, towards that um, more health equity and resilience um, focus. So I'll talk more about this. Um, I keep using this slide. I started using this slide a number of years ago because I think it's really illustrative of um, you know how we spent so many decades really focused in hypersensitive to our power plants and neglected our buildings. And what we know is our buildings actually produce as much harmful air pollution as you know gas power plants that sit in downtown Denver. Um, it's just less obvious and more subtle, and it's been pervasively affecting the health of all of us for quite some time. This was a California study, but we certainly have studies here in Colorado that mirror this um, as well in terms of contribution of buildings. Um, and Colin did a masterful job of talking through a lot of that analysis. You know, as well um, as we think about our work here in Boulder, um, you know, I focus on the energy space specifically, um, and in particular our buildings. And energy equity is really a component of this. We need um, healthy buildings, we need fossil free buildings, we need energy that's affordable and provides for the well being um, for people who need that energy use, right? We cannot have energy so unaffordable that um, people are struggling um, to have cooling when they need it during extreme weather events. Um, so this is centers a lot of our work to really mitigate this energy cost burden. So what I'm showing you is a graph um, that's a bit old from the Colorado Energy Office, but really these numbers continue to hold. Um, you know, the average household spends maybe 2% of their gross income on energy costs. We have people in our community who technically spend 100% of their income on their energy costs. Um, you know, unsubsidized, like, fortunately, you know, we have subsidies and things to support them, but that's a material impact for Coloradans. And you know, certainly we know, you know, roughly 30% experience some level of burden and 10%, and I think that mirrors very well in Boulder specifically, um, at least 10% of our, our residents are paying more than 10% of their income towards energy costs, um, which is of concern. So as we think about how we decarbonize our buildings, um, how we invest in clean energy, we want to make sure that Along with that, we're providing long-term solutions for those most in need so that they um, really have the level of social resilience and economic resilience that we as a community a whole need as we face the challenges of climate change. Um, I use this one as well. You are not intended to be able to read the small print on this slide. Um, but just to say the problem isn't unique to just residents. Um, we do have small businesses as well. Um, who experience the, the same challenges with energy cost burden. And coincidentally, um, these are also many of the same um, places where you see issues around indoor air pollutants and issues of concern. Restaurants, um, laboratories, food service, um, they're all exposed to pollutants associated with gas combustion appliances as well. And so there continues to be a definite synergy as we think about where energy cost burden is showing up as well as where we have the most vulnerability um, towards pollutants in the indoor areas. Um, so we have a mission really in, in our work to move towards healthy, efficient, and resilient buildings. Um, Boulder has about 44,000 residential units. So this is roughly just over 20,000 single family in the balances, multifamily properties, about 3,700 commercial buildings. Um, our buildings represent two thirds of our greenhouse gas emissions. So they're the predominant source of our emissions. Um, you know, I, I use these, you know, what we build um, lasts for 50 or more years. Modifying something built is really challenging. And so that really centers how we strategize around this. It's also important to know, and we think in Boulder, the, the metric may be just a little less than 90%, per, but on average, people spend 90% of their time indoors. Um, and so making sure those spaces are healthy and providing um, for the comfort that's necessary is really important. 
Um, so starting with our really equity centered um, goals, you know, we want to maintain housing affordability while homes are more efficient, safe healthy and resilient. Um, so we are targeting a number of programs, leveraging our own dollars through our um, climate tax, federal money, state utility dollars. Um, we've partnered with um, an organization called Energy Outreach Colorado. They are the statewide implementer of um, utility-based programs to support weatherization um, for low-income households. Um, they are the administrator of what's called the Colorado Affordable um, Residential Energy Program, where we combine um, dollars from municipalities or government agencies like ours with utility incentives from, in our case, Excel Energy to provide no cost um, weatherization and now electrification um, for low income households. So our partnership with them, um, we're investing roughly a million dollars a year um, in our early years and continuing to work towards growing that um, is really targeted at um, bringing electrification into these households. And so um, we've been doing a lot of work um, starting to ramp up uh, partnerships with local implementers, you know, so contractors that'll work within our housing stock. We also laid a lot of foundation. Um, one of the, the challenges when we try to implement our equity programs is really building trust and capacity and support within our communities who have been largely you know, mis underrepresented um, in our government and um, disproportionately impacted by a lot of decision-making. Um, so we did spend quite, we've been spending quite a time, particularly in our manufactured housing communities, um, implementing repair programs. And so we um, took it, it's hard to say, take advantage of the weather related issues um, that were associated with the Marshall Fire, but we did have roughly 400 um, homes that reported wind damage the same day as the Marshall fire occurred from those straight line winds. Um, so we had households, you know, that had torn roofs, sidings, other damage, lost windows and doors, um, and took our um, climate focused efforts into those communities to make those repairs and do that pre-weatherization work. And now we're able, you know, we've connected with, you know, hundreds of households and are able to get them into our pipeline to now upgrade their heating and cooling equipment, um, cooking equipment um, through our programs. And so we're um, making steady progress. It's definitely our goal um, to ensure that all 1,300 of our manufactured homes in our community are much more resilient um, to the effects of climate change. Uh, this year, we updated our building code. So, you know, one of our premises is build right now um, so that you ha don't have to change it later. Um, so the city adopted our latest code update in June of this year. It is setting all electric requirements for all new construction, both residential and commercial. There's some exceptions still for um, commercial, specifically um, commercial kitchens, certain types of laboratory spaces, hospitals, and some industrial, but then we offer um, incentives or carrots within the code to still encourage electrification. For example, um, you know, if you elect to do a commercial kitchen with all electric equipment, it's much easier to comply um, with our code, um, even though we allow you to have gas. Um, this code goes into effect. We understand, you know, at some point we may join the, the many um, jurisdictions that are currently being challenged um, for trying to take these measures. Um, we look forward to the fight. Um, and are also thinking about, you know, how to preserve the, the um, principles of this in other ways, just in case. Um, so rest assured, our intention is new buildings are going to be built right um, and consistent with our current code. We do other regulations um, to try and drive improvement to existing buildings. Um, so like some jurisdictions, um, we do have building performance requirements. Um, this is trying to encourage commercial properties to make investment. Um, we're going to be updating these in these coming years, um, but just to give you a sense that we do tackle local ordinance and other ways to, to drive improvements. We have a um, regulation that addresses rental properties. Um, we set a minimum performance standard for those. We're anticipating that we'll be amending that, um, our smart rights regulation to take more aggressive um, approaches to mitigating use of natural gas in buildings. Um, that's to be determined, um, but we expect to bring something to our council in the next year. Lead by example, um, we're proving this out and, and making sure that we're making our own buildings um, carbon free and gas free. Uh, Colin touched on some of our community programs. We do partner with Boulder County through their Energy Smart and PACE programs and actually fund um, staff resources as well as incentive programs through those 
one-stop shops that offer countywide um, so that uh, we can support our businesses and residents. And these are some of the statistics I think to date since these programs have been underway, about 5,000 homes in Boulder have gone through the program, uh, 1,200 businesses. We've invested about 8 million in efficiency improvements. Um, this is not all, um, this is since the start of the programs. Um, more recently, we only do electrification and, and weatherization measures through these programs, but certainly have made substantial investment. Um, we have taken, um, as Colin also mentioned, a very um, focused look at equity, both in our residential and commercial programs. Um, so one of the unique things we offer through the PACE program right now is one's focused on small um, restaurants and groceries to improve refrigeration um, equipment. And we offer um, cooking electrification incentives um, to support transitioning appliances um, to cleaner solutions. So um, lots of strategies that we're using to tackle it. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I have it in case you wanna know. I mean, we certainly have a breadth of, of large and small buildings throughout the community that we really think about as we center our goals and look at emissions versus pollution. Um, but certainly we know our buildings are, are substantially contributing emissions pollutants um, to the environment that are harmful and trying to work towards that. Um, I won't go through this again, have it, but we track, um, for example, this one is showing, you know, how many heat pumps at the bottom here. Um, as of 2023, um, we had rebated. So you can see we're rebating air source heat pumps, heat pump water heaters. Um, periodically, we've had a ground source system. Um, how many dollars we're investing and in, in trying to support the community here. The same thing on our commercial side. Um, you can see you know, how many millions of dollars in utility cost savings that are realized through some of the investments that are being made, as well as the number of businesses we've served. And I'll just conclude with a little bit of policy work and, and add to some of what Colin said. You know, I think um, Boulder, we've really recognize policy, um, both like regulatory and legislative action, as well as litigated action as some of the ways to drive systemic change um, in the most successful and aggressive way. And certainly through some of our efforts, for example, you're trying to separate from the Excel system through our municipalization work, we know that we drove um, Excel farther, faster um, towards its own um, clean electricity goals, which is really the foundation of our ability to move our buildings to electricity. Um, you know, so I once did a calculation, you know, on the cost effectiveness of, of investing in municipalization, and it's amazing how much carbon reduction um, we, we can certainly recognize that we influenced um, with just that investment. We are continuing our lawsuit against Suncor and ExxonMobil for their climate harms. Um, we're very active at the Public Utilities Commission. Um, in addition to what Max is going to talk about in terms of our Dr. Cog grant, um, we played a, um, we, Denver and, and others played an important role in getting another $400 million of investment through Excel in building decarbonization um, that will be coming into the market here um, towards the end of this year and invested over the next few years. Um, so we're really growing the, the dollars available, the programs available to support communities. I'm really proud of the, the work we've been when doing um, through our regulatory work and our policy efforts. So with that, I think I stopped sharing and I pass to, um, I can't remember who's next. So Laura, you'll tell me. That's right. Thank you very much, Carolyn. And next we have Mel Yama of the city of Crested Butte. Um, city of Crested Butte has made a big splash with some of their policies and I can't wait to hear more details. A small place with a big impact. Thank you for being here, Mel. So thank you so much. Um, I will go ahead and attempt to share my screen as well. <laughs> um, let's see. Let me know if this is that working okay. That looks great. Okay, great. All right. Well, hello everyone. My name is Mel Yemma. I'm the town of Crested Butte's long range planner, and I worked really closely with our building official through our last building code update where we require all new construction to be all electric. Um, so today I'm gonna talk through how and why we adopted that new code and how it's going so far today. Um, so I really like to start with overall, overall our foundation leading into the update of our building code. We typically update our code on a six year cycle and really would just kind of look through 
um, what are the new international building codes, what's changed, and it just really wasn't much of a process. But in 2019, the town of Crested Butte adopted a new climate action plan, which really set an important foundation to look at how important our building code is as a tool to influence um, the town's approach for mitigating climate change. So in that climate action plan, um, it set short-term goals of reducing the town um, town's greenhouse gas emissions by 2023, as well as a long-term aspiration of working towards becoming a net zero community. And specifically, it identified strategies in the building energy use chapter of adopting above code standards and considering an electrification policy. And then another impetus that led to um, and really influenced updating our building code was that Tri-State, who um, are, were part of an electric co-op here that purchases wholesale power from Tri-State, they had their um, electric or energy resource plan approved by the PUC, which committed them to reducing their emissions by 80% by 2030. So that commitment at the grid level was really powerful in looking at how we approached our building code update. Um, so why building codes? In Crested Butte, building energy use produces over 80% of our GHG emissions. So this is how much energy they're using as well as where that energy is coming from. And a study that was found by one of our council members from um, the Canadian Commission on Building and Fire Codes found that building codes have the potential to reduce building energy use emissions up to 81% residentially and 68% for commercial. So these are such an important policy lever for towns and cities to look at when it comes to how can we influence um, the biggest source of our emissions, essentially. And why electrification? There are so many reasons why we want to consider electrification in our building code. Um, first off being how can we really reduce our emissions and change where that energy is coming from and knowing that at the grid level, electric energy is becoming more and more renewable as time goes on. But there are a lot of other reasons um, that were really important to our town council and community around the carbon budget, knowing how can we try to not lock in new buildings right now and lock in gas boilers and appliances and just lock in those emissions for a very long time. Um, knowing that heat pumps and um, other technology are getting more and more efficient over time, how can we really reduce total energy needs um, and costs of the consumers as well? There are also efficiencies around costs of running two different pipes into buildings. Looking at indoor air quality where gas stoves can raise risks for asthma and other illnesses. And then also that electrification is really easy to access and that there's a lot more tax credits, technology and momentum coming out around them. But um, it's also one of those kind of dining table decisions where as an individual, you can really have an impact on um, your emissions and driving change forward at that individual level. And then this was a question that was raised a lot um, through our building code process, but is electric really less emission? So we already know that Tri-State, where we get our power from, committed to that 80% reduction by 2030. So we already, we modeled um, a 3,000 square foot house in Crested Butte, and this is in the graph on the right showing today's grid. We already see that electric heating when modeling that was already a little less emissions, but then when you fast forward to 2030 with that commitment, that really drops. And we already see a big difference as well if you also added solar to the home as well. So while we're already looking at um, a better scenario for today, that's just gonna get better over time and those lifetime carbon emissions are gonna be much better in an all electric home. So we set forth using all of that kind of foundation to update our code. And this was in 2022, updating our code to the 2021 code. And as I mentioned, typically our code process is really nothing. Our building official will kind of look through, see what's changed. It goes through an ordinance through our town council. No one shows up or comments, but we knew because we were going to consider some above code provisions as well as a potential electrification policy component to it, we really needed to do some outreach and more of a process around it. So we spent a lot of time doing research and analysis, and we worked with a local engineering firm, resource engineering group here to help us do that. We did a lot of um, outreach with the public, the building community, and with the town council to really vet what are some of those alternative considerations we're looking at and gain feedback on that. And then we went through an adoption process. It adopted with a first hearing and a public hearing, and then we gave six months until effective enforcement. So starting January last year in 2023, our new building code was um, in effect.
and where we landed. And I put a QR code up in the top here. If anyone wants to scan to that, that'll take you to kind of a fact sheet and overview of our new building code. Um, but we adopted certain above code provisions for residential and commercial, um, as well as for any new construction to require, um, it has to be all electric. So that's your heating, your hot water heating, your appliances and everything. We did allow for this time a commercial kitchen exemption for new commercial kitchens. Um, so for residential new construction, we have that electric requirement, um, as well as some other prov provisions such as um, achieving certification through the Department of Energy Zero Energy Ready Home Program, which includes some solar ready provisions. And then we also had some different electric vehicle readiness and charging requirements as well. And I won't go through all the details, but um, definitely check out that fact sheet. And then for significant remodels, so what we call a level three remodel, where more than 50% um, of the home is being worked on, we are requiring that those to become electric ready. And I love to share this part of the political story of how did we get this code adopted. Um, but we had a town council that really prioritizes a few key things. One is climate change and climate action. Two is affordable housing and really retaining our community. And three, I would say, is around transportation and mobility. Um, so our town council felt very accountable to our climate action plan and that tri-state commitment was a very compelling consideration where we could say, hey, this is already a better choice. We know it's going to get better versus, oh, let's just wait till, you know, our grid's more ready. This really helped us really seize the moment um, at the time. They also really looked at the equity of building codes and um, they made sure to really, they really prioritized in the process really being transparent to our constituents about cost, affordability, impacts of what an all electric code could be. And that's really challenging to do because building a home or building a new building, there's so many variables that could influence the cost, but we really did our best to model that with lots of different examples. Um, what also, what I think was really important with the equity of building codes that was a big part of the story was that, remember that we're a very small town. <laughs> so even compared to Boulder, while they're saying 44,000 residential homes, we have 1,200 and some residential homes and about 60-ish vacant lots. Um, knowing towns and cities never stop developing, there's always lots of redevelopment. We only have about 60 vacant lots right now. Half of the units on those lots were and are part of a big affordable housing project that we're working on that we already committed to being above code, being zero energy ready, um, and being all electric. So it was really important to our council to say, hey, we're already committing to that. Why would we hold kind of the free market and these other lots to a different standard? So that was a big part of the story as well. We also had a lot of support from the climate action community um, and really not much pushback from the building community. The only kind of loud voice that showed up at the public hearing was Atmos Energy, our natural gas provider. And they didn't make a compelling enough argument to our town council. Um, so there really wasn't much pushback. And then lastly, at the time of adopting our new code, the town came out with our new comprehensive plan called the Community Compass. Um, and what that compass is, is essentially a decision-making framework that's really grounded in the Crested Butte community values of authentic, connected, accountable, and bold. Um, so the, using that framework to work through this code process was really helpful to our council to make sure this was a decision aligned with their values. And surprisingly, this wasn't a decision that they found to be bold. They really found it to be more accountable um, to our climate action plan and to our community. So how's it going so far? So there's a lot of different projects coming through, ranging from free market, single family homes to parts of those housing projects we're working on from affordable multifamily, duplex, triplexes, and quads. And we're seeing different mechanical systems and different designs. So we're seeing some kind of um, heat pumps using radiant water to air, or I'm um, sorry, yeah, water to air transfer of um, heating. We're seeing air to air transfer with more like forced air heating systems and a lot of different things that things are working through. And we're really using our town housing projects as case studies to really build capacity among our contractors and work through hurdles. And some have been really smooth sailing and others have been challenging. And we've really taken that opportunity to just work through it. Um, we even, you know, brought out kind of an old matrix of, hey, let's compare these different heating systems and see what works best with different factors to just really work hand in hand with the building community to make sure we could get it right. 
Um, so one case study I wanted to share was um, Mineral Point, which is under construction right now. This is 34 units and a bike barn, bike barn up across three buildings, and it's a low-income housing tax credit um, unit building. And they're building to all of our code standards. They're using air-to-air -air heat pumps and individual heat pump water heaters in each unit. And right now, their projected cost per square foot is 395 um dollars per square foot, which for Crested Butte right now is really quite good. Um, costs on everything have just really skyrocketed since COVID and we can't really just pinpoint it. We haven't been able to pinpoint it to the building code. It's it's um, concrete, it's labor, it's everything. So uh, that's been, it's been really helpful to have these case studies to work through on that. Um, and we've had some lessons learned as we've worked through these case studies. So one is that integrating the new code early into the design is critical. If we just kind of design to how we typically design a house and then, hey, let's stop in a heat pump later on, we're going to run into challenges, especially when it comes to that interface of the all electric code with meeting the zero energy ready home um, certification process. Really working through that early at the start has been really critical. Um, and then there's also things to think about as far as maintenance implications for all electric too. So especially in our climate, we need to think about, hey, where is the heat pump going? Is it going to be in a place where we're going to have a ton of snow fall on it or a place that the person living in the unit can't access to maintain or check on? And there's been some of those considerations to work through as well. And then we've over overall just kind of found changing existing practices is hard, but it's doable. So there's still a lot of hesitancies and unknowns, a lot of are you sure this is really going to be comfortable for the person? Are you sure this is going to work? Is it going to be loud? It seems really big. And just really kind of working through together to see, hey, this is possible um, to really find examples of success and, and make tweaks What from our lessons learned, what can we do to really improve the situation and move forward together. So I'm really excited to share that we took a lot of those lessons learned to really um, build some more local capacity and education. So I put another QR code here where the Colorado Energy Office has an energy code adoption and enforcement grant program that we partnered with our regional entities on to gain funding from um, to really build capacity and do more education and trainings to really have more support for implementing our new code. So we're first building staff capacity on our end and expertise. So as of um, since our new code was adopted, we have a new building inspector and a new sustainability coordinator that are really helping to build this capacity. We create we worked with Group 14 and other engineering form with funding from this grant to create a zero energy ready home toolkit with design and mechanical considerations to really help our architects, designers, contractors integrate all electric very early into the design process. And then what this grant also did was provided funding um, for a scholarship program to build capacity for HERS readers and builder education and things like that. So you could apply for the scholarship to get um, mechanical, to get equipment to become a certified HERS reader, to get your certification or any sort of energy efficiency professional certification, that scholarship is there for you. I think I just have one more slide. I'm sorry if I've gone over. Um, but where do we go from here? With our new code, we committed to doing a three-year code update. So that's coming up again next year in 2025. We are updating our climate action plan this year to help influence that process. And one big thing we're going to be looking at in our new code as well, our current code really focuses on new construction. We're going to look into electrification considerations for remodels. What are the important levers there of requiring, incentivizing, things like that. When if someone's going in and they're going to be disturbing an electric area around their boiler or their stove or something, is there a way there we can influence that conversion? Um, but then we also know it's important to really complement building codes with retrofit programs for existing buildings. So while, you know, we only maybe get a dozen um, buildings coming in for a building permit each year, that's just a really small piece of that pie to influence how to make those buildings more energy efficient or get them to convert to electric. So how can we really tackle the rest of our building stock is so important. So we have a really successful program called Green Deed, where we um, provide free energy assessments and improvements up to $5,000 for any deed-restricted affordable housing unit in Crested Butte, which is actually a quarter of our housing stock. So that's a great place to start. 
And then we're also really looking at how can we leverage the Inflation Reduction Act, um, rebates from our electric co-op and others and town funding to really look at what sort of incentives can help move the needle to electrify existing buildings. And I think this is my last slide. I just wanted to put a quick plug for that um, Zero Energy Ready Home and All Electric Toolkit. So check out that QR code. It's on our building um, department page on our website if you want to check that out. And I think that is it. And thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, Mel. I'm so excited about all the amazing work that you're doing. And uh, for everyone uh, attending, I will be posting this on one of our web pages with resources. I'll be emailing you and sharing. And you can always email me uh, with your questions. And we do still have a little time left at the end for Q&A. But right now, we're moving on to Mac Prather of the City of Denver. Uh, please introduce yourself and share some of your programs with us. I know you're doing a lot of good work in Denver as well. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. I, can you all see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the invite. Mac Prather, joining you all from City and County of Denver's Climate Action Office. And uh, I, I do have slides, of course, some of these will be similar information to what our other hosts have shared. So I'm gonna kind of fly through these and focus on a broad strokes overview of, of the policies and programs in Denver related to building decarbonization. And, and to start, I uh, just wanna introduce not only myself, but the Office of Climate Action here. Uh, what we're doing is uh, partnering with communities in Denver to reduce pollution and create the ways we can adapt and thrive in the face of our changing environment. Uh, it's our work to engage every Denverite to be part of those solutions uh, so that we'll be vibrant and prosperous for generations to come. And uh, the way we can do that in Denver is that we're very lucky to have what's called the Climate Protection Fund. This was uh, voted in by Denverites in November, 2022 to add a, a sales tax on luxury goods, which provides uh, the dollars to do the work across these six allowable uses. So you'll see those icons there that include things like green workforce, renewables, um, adaptation and resiliency, environmental justice, transit, and then of course, buildings and homes, which we're talking about today. That. Uh, pie chart you see is really a summary of how we're trying to spend those funds over the first five years um, of their implementation. And I'll just point out that a big chunk of that pie chart is buildings and homes, of course. Uh, and Denver, much like some of the other uh, areas represented here, uh, about 64% of our emissions in the city and county of Denver are from our buildings and homes. Uh, we have similar goals to what Carolyn was describing uh, for Denver's emissions. We also have goals specific to these new buildings and existing building stock, how we will get those to zero emissions. And we know that it's not only important because of the, the emissions that we can reduce from you know, increasing the efficiency, electrifying those buildings, but there are real impacts to uh, to safety and, and health, uh, as Colin was talking about, about 30 to 40% of low income households in Denver uh, have carbon monoxide equipment, uh, fail carbon monoxide equipment, leakage tests for old equipment. And so Colin was describing the, the imperfect venting of some of that, uh, those old wheezy gas furnaces. Uh, the truth is that in older buildings where maybe maintenance is more deferred, uh, those safety issues are, are really critical for a lot of households. And we already talked about heat pumps a little bit, uh, but again, I'll just foot stomp that this technology is a real key solution to um, getting rid of the emissions from our buildings in this in Denver's cold climate in the region here. Uh, I, and I'm an engineer, so Efficiency is always the first fuel. We should always be talking about the ways to improve building efficiency and electrify. But uh, this technology is here now. It works in Denver's climate. I can talk about this for 
the whole 15 minutes if you all want me to, but I, I will spare you. So if you're in the region, you want to know more about uh, what a heat pump is and what incentives are available to you in Denver or outside of Denver, I've included a, a great resource at the bottom of that slide for you to check out. Uh, Lauren asked that we, we talk about codes and, and policies. And so I'm just going to briefly touch on, on some of those in Denver. Uh, here's kind of a, a snapshot looking at both current state and the goals for um, building code here. Uh, 2022 energy code is, is highlighted here because that has considerations for commercial building electrification at the time of equipment replacement. And it includes incentives for uh, electric equipment, energy efficiency, on-site renewables, and equipment that is demand responsive. So it's, it's beneficial to the grid. Uh, I think you'll have access to these slides, so I won't uh, ask you to squint and read those, those goals. But this is these are the, uh, the longer term goals that Denver is working towards via uh, building code. There are also building performance programs in Denver. Uh, here, because of the Energized Denver Ordinance, which includes considerations for electrification of equipment, uh, requirements for building benchmarking, and building performance requirements. Going to just breeze through this, but uh, right now, large buildings in Denver are required to uh, benchmark their per performance and achieve uh, targets over time to improve their uh, use of energy. We have programs uh, to support building owners and, and um, that community, as well as um, enhanced incentives and um, offerings for what we call equity priority buildings, things like uh, human service providers, nonprofits, affordable housing. So those resources are all available on our Energized Denver Hub online. For smaller buildings, 5,000 uh, to just under 25,000 square feet, there are prescriptive requirements, which are a little bit simplified. And, and typically, that looks like a building replacing some old lighting with LED lighting. We also have folks in Denver that are starting to work with that equity priority building community of small business owners, so these smaller commercial buildings, and really walk through the process of meeting these requirements, uh, getting local incentives, and, and find out what other offerings we can be offering to those uh, building owners and renters. There is a host of other programs and incentives that Denver offers. Uh, we'll focus on a couple of these that I work on, but we uh, to run through the list, we have incentives for heat pumps in all building types across Denver, commercial buildings, uh, the largest multifamily buildings down to um, you know, single family homes, duplexes, and townhomes. We have uh, some targeted programs for lower income households, specifically working with folks uh, who are living with respiratory conditions. That's called our Healthy Homes Program. And we also have um, programs to help buildings convert from Denver's steam system if they wish to do so. Um, of course, we work with the facilities that Denver owns to help them meet our own requirements and uh, set the, set the uh, example there. And we work with new construction projects to pilot new technologies and approaches just like uh, Mel was describing. Uh, one thing to highlight additionally is we have some ongoing work for cooking electrification. Uh, Chef Andrew Fourlines is a new addition to our staff here in Denver, and he brings uh, the background of a professional chef, uh, helping to offer education about the induction technology that uh, has so many benefits for both the commercial and the in-home context. And we'll be doing some, some uh, listening sessions, getting feedback, doing cooking demonstrations, uh, hands-on technology, all kinds of things. Uh, if you're interested or want to participate in those, there is a QR code there that can help you get in touch with Andrew. And uh, right now, we're also doing those induction cooking replacements through Denver's Healthy Homes Program. Uh, 
So we are working with some of those homeowners, folks who, you know, might be living with asthma. And if they're ready to get rid of that old gas stove, we're helping them install a new uh, fancy induction cooktop with new cookware uh, and ventilation and all sorts of other great things. Uh, the, I think the focus really today was on equity. So I wanted to highlight a couple of things that Denver is doing uh, to make sure that these funds are um, spent in an equitable manner. One is this equity priority building index that our colleagues have worked on based on a lot of community engagement, feedback and data analysis. And this is a publicly accessible platform that uh, matches a, a whole lot of different indicators to give us some idea of um, where there might be buildings that are more in need of services or serving communities across Denver that have different risks. So we're looking at things like, uh, you know, beyond your standard demographic information, we're looking at um, asthma rates, uh, looking at age of, of folks living in these areas, really to try and layer those risks on top of each other and understand uh, where there might be more needs across Denver. So this is a tool we use, but we also want to make sure that's accessible to community. So there's a link on the slide. We have, as I mentioned, enhanced services for um, what we call, again, equity priority buildings to help uh, set targets, help them plan projects, and make the most out of all the incentives that are available. And uh, this is kind of the framework that, that we use for, for the, all those programs. Mapping, identification, working on ways we can get out in the community and find those partners, engaging directly with the community, working on unintended consequences, uh, and then directing our investments and programs for those communities. The Healthy Homes Program here in Denver, of course, everybody has a Healthy Homes Program, but uh, our program is really focused on building electrification and efficiency. This is one that I work with closely. It has three goals, one to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to improve indoor air quality, and of course, reduce vulnerability to extreme heat, all done by um, converting to heat pumps. Also sealing up building envelope, increasing efficiencies, and uh, getting rid of some of those old gas appliances and replacing them with their more efficient, better alternatives. This work, again, is, is focused on lower income households, specifically folks with respiratory conditions. And so we're uh, very grateful for some of the outreach that Physicians for Social, Social Responsibility has helped with for this program in the past. We are working with uh, healthcare providers and practitioners to get them to make referrals directly to this program and are really interested in trying to continue to make some of those connections between health. Uh, and even though these projects are expensive, you know, we're doing air quality monitoring, we're doing weatherization and electrification, uh, we're getting people on solar gardens and utilizing all these rebates. The cost is still very high, but the thesis is uh, if folks in these households have asthma or have breathing conditions, and we can help them avoid one hospital treatment, one ER visit, uh, you know, and that's where a lot of households end up for this kind of critical care. Uh, the cost overall uh, is is a worthwhile investment. So that's the direction we'd like to see the the kind of outcomes of this program go. We'd love to be working with. Um, other areas in the region, we'll talk about that in a minute, and making some of those connections with uh, Medicaid, Medicare, healthcare providers, and, and folks who are working really on these issues of health. So if you, uh, we are still accepting folks to that program. If you're in Denver, if you have um, folks who have a rental unit in Denver that's naturally occurring affordable housing, if you know a homeowner in Denver who might qualify for this, please share this information. And then a, a few of our uh, other presenters have, have talked about the regional collaboration and the effort going on. Of course, you see that reflected in all of these presentations. But the very big exciting news is that um, award announcement from EPA's Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program. 
and yeah, we're we're all kind of dancing <laughs> in some of us internally, some of us uh, on video. But uh, I've included some press links there. You can go directly to the Denver Regional Council of Governments website to learn more about that program. But that will be bringing uh, uh, almost two hundred million dollars to the Dr. Cog region, Front Range, Colorado, uh, to work on the efforts we've been talking about today. Things like incentives, uh, building policies, codes, uh, direct implementation for low-income households, and uh, we're very everyone that's worked on that program. I think is is very excited to see that start to take off and uh, amplify the work that everyone has been doing. Uh, just included some photos here of of some of the folks that collaborated on that application led by Denver Regional Council of Governments. There was a press event to announce that. And uh, here are some of the measures that, and the, the initial goals, of course, these are um, from the application and will kind of be refined as the team works on these, but uh, to give folks a sense of the, the scale and the work that will be done with this award and really the potential to um, affect what's about 50% of the population of the state in the region that Dr. Cog represents. So again, a big focus on low income, disproportionately affected communities and those justice 40 communities and uh, the market transformation that's really required to uh, help everybody continue to install these heat pumps and do it in a, in a high quality way. So we're very excited about that. We'd love to um, connect folks as those planning efforts get underway with Dr. Cog uh, or Denver Re Regional Council of Governments and um, there will be more opportunities to participate in that as it as it gets closer. For uh, Denver, I've included my own contact information as well as some um, program contact information if folks have specific questions about programs. And uh, that is all for me. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Mac. I know we need to do this again and bring out a few more people and give everyone a little bit more time to talk next time. But it is also so wonderful to have every one of you here with us. So uh, next up is Glenn Pease and Brad Smith from Fort Collins describing some of their programs as well, including uh, weatherization and uh, utility oriented work, uh, policy work. So. Uh, Please go ahead and share. I don't know which of you wants to go first, but we're here. Uh, we still have a, plenty of time for a presentation and at least five minutes of uh, Q&A. Thank you. Great. Can everybody hear me? I'm hopeful. Yes, yes, definitely. Okay. Well. Wonderful. So let me get the presentation up and see if I can share my screen. Okay. Am I in presentation mode or am I in the note screen? Uh, you still need to go to presentation all the way. One more step, slideshow. Yeah, I'm seeing your note screen, Brad. How about that? There we go. Uh, okay, wonderful. Um, well, we'll get started. I'll, I'll abbreviate this a little bit. I know we're running short on time and everybody really presented a lot of great content. And I wanna make sure that we save some time for some questions because I'm sure people will have some. So first, I almost just wanna say we could almost just shorten ours so much by saying we're just pretty much copying everything that uh, everybody that's presented before has done. So amazing work happening. And um, I think everybody needs to recognize that the state of Colorado is really a leader in this effort right now. So you know, hats off to everybody doing this work. Um, it's recognized nationally. Um, and it's hard work. So we'll dive right into it. My name is Brad Smith. Um, I'm Energy Code Project Manager for the City of Fort Collins. Um, I'm tag teaming, teaming this effort with Glenn. Glenn runs one of our other uh, home efficiency programs, so he'll talk a little bit uh, after my slides are done. 
my focus is primarily building energy codes. So really where are we going with buildings in the future? Um, so we'll kind of drive uh, through the slides uh, now. I wanna start by just framing this a little bit. I think some other folks have shared kind of where uh, they're headed with their climate goals for the city of Fort Collins or cities. City of Fort Collins is very similar. Um, we're targeting um, an 80% percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions below 2005 levels by 2030. Uh, and uh, city citywide carbon neutral by year 2050. So 2030 target is our focus right now. I'm just going to set the stage with a little bit of context, and I'll go through this pretty quick. I always like to start by uh, explaining a little bit about building code. This is a national map of uh, states energy code. And as you can see, Colorado has no statewide code. For some of us, the more progressive jurisdictions, this is a good thing. Uh, it allows us to amend the code to kind of align with our climate goals and get a little more aggressive as we need, um, as we set uh, goals for, for buildings, especially in the future. So I'm not going to touch too much on this. Some people are already familiar a little bit with House Bill 221362, but this kind of establishes a minimum energy code and then also model low energy and carbon code uh, and um, electric, solar, and PV ready code at the state level. So some of those um, code initiatives are are taking place and being uh, enacted right now we're currently working on the model low energy and carbon code uh, and that will be um, uh, implemented in july 1st of 2026. so a little bit of background on city of fort collins we adopt code every three years we're currently on the 2021 body of codes we do have some local amendments. I kind of mentioned that before. We strengthened our code, and those local amendments include electric ready, solar ready, and EV infrastructure in our code. So we are building out some projects right now that do have electric ready, solar ready, and then we're starting to see EV infrastructure go into a lot of the new development town. So it's pretty exciting to see that being built out. In terms of building code, um, I want to talk a little bit about this because I think most people that we communicate with in the community aren't aware of how uh, people navigate through building energy code specifically, but there are really four compliance pathways that are available to builders and developers. And I'll quickly go through these and to kind of set the stage for uh, what's to come here in the next couple of slides. First is a prescriptive. It is basically a thou shalt install to this way. UA alternative, the key here is requires modeling of a building. So we're modeling for performance of a building. Then there's what's called a performance path. Um, that also requires modeling of the building. Uh, it's based off of an energy cost to demonstrate compliance. And then there's an ERI path for residential and an ASHRAE 90.1 uh, path for commercial buildings. And again, both of those require modeling uh, of the building for performance. Uh, we like the performance path and over well over half of the buildings and homes in town typically pursue the building path. One of the reasons is it provides flexibility. It provides a little bit of transparency. There are real energy outcomes. So we know kilowatt hours and we know therms of buildings uh, before they're even built. And it allows for us, especially City of Fort Collins, to have access to some sort of data informed decision making as we kind of look to what we're exploring in the future. And I'll touch on that here in a second. Most of this is driven by our climate future. This is our climate plan. Within that climate plan, we have a big move six, which is efficient emissions free buildings. Uh, each one of these big moves has supporting moves. One of the supporting moves for big move six is to develop an energy performance path to uh, for new construction to zero carbon building by 2030. That's really uh, key to what I'm going to present on here in the next couple of slides. Key language in this is zero carbon, so everybody can kind of get an idea of really where we're headed for new construction. Uh, just to set a little bit of stage for our climate future, the three primary goals for year 2030 uh, within this Our Climate Future plan are to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80 percent below 25 levels or 2005 levels. 100% renewable electricity and zero waste and or 100% landfill diversion. Knowing what we had ahead of us uh, in the development of this performance path to zero carbon, uh, we decided to pursue a funding opportunity that the Department of Energy announced underneath the bipartisan infrastructure law. This was announced in 2022. Uh, there's a total of $45 million available over five years and the Department of Energy was anticipating 10 to 30 uh, awards. 
areas of interest you can see on the right, um, some of the biggest areas of interest for us were, of course, uh, workforce development. That's a big focus for us right now. Innovative approaches and then equity uh, and environmental justice, especially focusing on Justice 40. Um, next slide, uh, kind of uh, here is kind of like where we landed. So Fort Collins was awarded uh, this uh, Department of Energy Award in July of 2023, um, providing a little bit of a technical summary of what this might look like. The idea is we're going to develop a performance path. Uh, we're going to establish EUI or energy use intensity targets and CO2E carbon dioxide equivalent uh, targets for new construction um, that sets us on that path to zero carbon new construction by 2030. We're going to do that um, stepped across the next three code cycles. So 2024, we're in the process of developing that right now, adopted likely 2025, um, about a year from now, uh, 2027 code, and then ultimately zero carbon by 2030. Uh, part of the work will involve a stakeholder group. This is really, the diversity of this stakeholder group is really driven by um, something uh, uh, that we have established uh, as part of our climate future plan, that is a climate equity committee. Um, and that committee really is to function uh, and um, as an equity accountability committee for the work that we do under our climate future. So we're working closely with them to bring those voices to that work. You can see on the right, we have some partners, uh, Florida Solar Energy Center, New Buildings Institute, International Code Council, and uh, Colorado Energy Office is the supporting state agency of this uh, project. Um, I mentioned we're adopting uh, first phase 2025, about a year from now. The benefit to all of this, and I think the benefit that the Department of Energy saw on this is the city of Fort Collins is the municipal utility. That means we have data. So we know how much energy use our buildings and homes use in the community. So not only will we develop this path to zero carbon, but we'll prove it out each of the three code cycles till we reach uh, our ultimate goal of zero carbon new construction by 2030. Um, I do want to kind of frame it to zero carbon is intentional. Uh, that means that typically we're uh, building to uh, standards that um, every building built within the community will produce as much energy as it consumes and it will not emit any site emissions. And this just kind of sets the stage for how this all started. Um, years ago, we started measuring uh, energy use in residential buildings. Um, and this just gives uh, you everybody kind of an idea of where we're headed, where we're currently at, and, and why we believe that we can really demonstrate that this can be done and we can prove this out. Um, we don't yet currently have 2021 uh, International Energy Conservation Code data, but what this shows is energy use in residential homes across the different code years. So you can see the code years down at the bottom, 2015, 2018 is the last code year that we have a full set of data from. Again, we're working on 2021. And it, it is establishing that EUR energy use per square foot of residential buildings in town. You can see the gray bar above that is the state average, and that was done through a compliance uh, study within the state. So we know some of the things that we've put in place in Fort Collins are lowering energy use in our residential homes. We know that for certain, uh, and that's a good thing. This also just kind of shows you the trajectory of what things are gonna look like to get to that zero carbon or zero energy by 2030. And ultimately it kind of looks like this. So we'll adopt in 2030, uh, implement probably a few months after that, and ultimately we should start seeing the performance of those buildings reach zero carbon. So that's where we're headed building code wise, and I wanna hand it off to Glenn Pease who manages our Epic Homes program. So I'll jump to Glenn's slide. Thanks, Brad. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Glenn Pease and I'm with the city of Fort Collins. Uh, Fort Collins operates a community owned utility and I manage our existing home energy upgrade programs at the city. I've been in the field of applied building science for over 15 years now. Excited to be here today. And I'd like to take about five more minutes of your time to supplement what everyone else has already shared with a little dose of some building air leakage vitamins uh, and a little bit of an equity moment. So I think we could echo everything everyone else is, is saying and wanted to nerd out a little bit um, on building air leakage. Uh, next slide, Brad. So Brad touched a bit on uh, Fort Collins Climate Action Plan. Um, 
one of the priorities from our city council is to address climate and air pollution. Um, and if we can get to that next slide um, and show that some of the visuals there. Thank you, Brad. Um, city council, um, one of the priorities uh, in their recent planning efforts is to reduce climate pollution and air pollution through best practices, emphasizing electrification. I kind of like to call this uh, strategic electrification and looking at uh, reducing air pollution uh, in our homes and, and businesses. Um, Fort Collins voters approved the sales tax uh, like many of the other um, municipalities here. So I won't go into details there, but I would like to share some of the initiatives and highlight a, a few things. Uh, so next slide, please, Brad. Um, so zooming in here a bit on pollution, uh, this picture on the right, this drawing on the right, uh, represents some of the common air leakage pathways that need to be sealed up, uh, in this case in homes, but also you can apply that to buildings, uh, commercial buildings as well. Uh, many of these air leaks come from areas that are not the cleanest air. As you can see, there's a lot of opportunities for improving homes and the health of residents. And we're not talking about just weather stripping here. Um, there's a lot of hidden holes in buildings. These holes are much easier to seal up when the home is being built. Um, so I appreciate all the worker work on strict code requirements for air leakage uh, for our existing buildings. Uh, a trained professional can help significantly in reducing air leakage in an existing home. Uh, Mac had touched on um, partnerships with Energy Outreach Colorado and Healthy Homes, uh, a lot of the similar work being done in Fort Collins as well. Um, I wanted to highlight a resource that will be shared um, in the email uh, that's going to be sent out as a follow-up. Um, there was a study done by Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, which found that there were 34% fewer acute care visits for children with asthma in a weatherized home compared to children with asthma who lived in unweatherized homes. So that's significant reduction in the number of visits uh, to um, address asthma attacks or other respiratory conditions. Um, so there's a direct correlation from that study and homes that were weatherized, reducing those air pollutant pathways um, and uh, the overall well-being of, of residents. The numbers are even more staggering when we zoom out on some of the demographics. Um, Black Americans are two to three times more likely to die from asthma because of environmental triggers compared to any other ethnic group. So weatherization, uh, and equity uh, are very much tied together here. Um, weatherization can also help lower utility bills uh, in some of the most vulnerable communities. Uh, so that's obviously an added bonus. Um, and to bring us back full circle to electrification, a, a well air sealed and insulated house um, helps the electric home perform even better. Um, heat pumps, they're clean, they're efficient, they're machines that help increase comfort, um, and they they provide both heating and cooling. They don't make heat. Um, they are heat moving machines, really. Um, they kind of act as a magnet to attract heat and move it from one space to another. Um, so it, it does have to work harder, though, in an unweatherized home. Uh, that's leaky and, and not as well insulated. So it is best practice to work on weatherization before installing a heat pump. This benefits the grid, this benefits residents, and it also benefits communities by creating jobs that can't be outsourced. One last point I wanna, wanna make here, I know we're really short on time, um, is uh, a motto uh, that's shared um, in kind of the building science realm of make it tight and ventilate it right. Um, so all of, all of this um, does require an attention to some controlled ventilation measures where you can um, seal up 
the, the building really tight. You can control where the air from outside is coming from. You can filter it and condition it and, and deliver it to the people. Buildings don't need to breathe. That's a common misconception. Um, it's the people that need to breathe. So a focus on uh, controlled ventilation is also important. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to just hand it over to Lauren and uh, really thank, thank you for uh, positions for social responsibility for all you do and this opportunity to share and uh, hand it over to you, Lauren, for, for questions. Again, I have learned uh, so much from both of you, uh, Lent and Brad from Fort Collins. And uh, I know I'm going to need to watch this again because there's no way I can absorb all of this, but it is amazing uh, work that you're doing, amazing awareness that you're raising. And we have two questions right now. I encourage anyone else who would like to, to put their questions in Q&A. Uh, the first question from Corey Carroll, um, if, um, Mac, if you have the website for heat pumps that was on a slide, um, maybe you can put it in the chat. Uh, for everyone or answer um, live or type in your answer on the Q&A. And Corey has another question that anyone can answer if um, if you know the answer, whether Weld County or Greeley have any programs to lower greenhouse gas emissions. And yeah. I I'll take a shot at it. I mean, I'm unaware of any specific programs, but um, do you want to note that, you know, portions of, of Weld County um, are within the Dr. Cog re region, and so we'll be um, benefiting from some of the, the programs that Mac discussed through the grant program, and also both um, receive um, gas service um, and some electric service from Excel Energy, and so there's certainly going to be a focus of some of the clean heat programs that Excel is going to be offering in those communities. So we do fully expect to see um, heat pump adoption extending um, even into communities where, you know, um, there may not be government capacity to take on some of the actions that, you know, for our colleagues in Fort Collins and ourselves have been able to take on because of our resources. Um, but we certainly are looking to have broad benefit across the region through our strategies. So I would offer that. Thanks, Carolyn. And I would just add that they, uh, they, their health department does have an air, air quality program. Um, and so uh, uh, I believe, um, I, I will put it in the chat. I, her name is at the top of my tongue, but, uh, I will, I will put the contact in the chat for their, their air quality lead. Thank you, Colin. Does anyone else have any questions? Does, uh, so anyone want to make a final statement? Any takeaway messages? Well, I'll just appreciate you all. I mean, I think for keeping this conversation going, you know, we often spend time in the, in the space of, you know, climate advocacy. And um, we know that the benefits of the work we do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions have far more reaching benefits than, than we're ever able to speak to. And so it's so important for organizations like yours to bring their voice, you know, into the same space we are talking with regulators and legislators. And it's really, I think, had a powerful effect in educating um, our Public Utilities Commission and others around the importance of air quality concerns. And so I, I just want to appreciate all of you for, you know, the volunteer work that you do um, through your organization. Thank you so much. Uh, so to everyone attending and to all our presenters, um, we so appreciate you. And to those attending, please tell others about this. Please watch your email. Please go to the resource page we'll be creating. Uh, we'll also be sharing opportunities to become involved on a lot of these issues. So uh, do, do watch your email and respond and reach out and email me so we can continue to have a conversation. Tell your mom, tell your kids, tell your friends, tell your family what's going on because without knowledge, what can we do? But with knowledge, uh, we can make the change we need together. So I wish you all a wonderful evening. And thanks again for being here, everyone. Bye-bye.